Uh, should we start? Sure. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody online and at the auditorium. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Richard Zemmel from uh, Columbia University talking about learning uninformative representations. Uh, 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 Rich, uh, take it away. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so I'd like to keep the talk informal. So if you have a question or comment, please speak up. And if I don't uh, hear you, can somebody just notify me and let me know somebody's trying to say something? Okay, thanks. All right, let me. So, so I, I mean, the talk today is going to be about representation learning. And generally, the way representation learning has been formulated for many years now, well, the idea was you wanted to find some representation that maximizes mutual information between Z and X. So this was Linsker's Infomax principle from 1988, and that dates back even further. It relates to the redundancy reduction ideas for, uh, for biological processing that Horace Barlow suggested in 61 that keeps coming up in uh, unsupervised learning contexts. Um, and you know, everybody knows about one application of this, which was ICA, right? The aim was to decompose and put into uh, independent components typically formulated as non-Gaussian that retain all the information in, uh, in X. But what I'm gonna focus on is how in many contexts, the real aim what you wanna do is remove information about particular quantities in the input. So let me start by giving some, uh, some examples about that from, from different applications in different scenarios. So in one case, you have you want to remove spurious features. You want to learn some predictor, but part of that prediction, uh, you, you know, is going to rely on some features that you don't want it to, right? So those are the spurious features. So this is an example from uh, some colleagues in health. They told me about that you build a if you build a predictor for diabetes based on health data, typically from North America, often from mostly white patients, is that the primary predictor for diabetes is the body mass index or BMI. But then you take that same predictor and you try to apply it to a different uh, culture uh, and that doesn't work at all. Like in Asia, as you see here in this curve, there's not the same relationship between uh, you know, diabetes and, and uh, body mass index. So it's uh, that varying relationship means that you wanna factor that out and find other other important features that allow you to predict uh, diabetes better, all right? So the question is how to remove these kinds of spurious features when you're building a predictor. Another example is uh, an old idea from, uh, again, from lear uh, machine learning of the information bottleneck. And in that one, the idea is you wanted to learn some representation T that uh, you should minimize the, or the negative mutual information between T and some target Y or maximize the information that T contains about Y and otherwise minimize the information that T has about X. So you're in a sense extracting all, only the information about X that's relevant to Y and removing all the other uh, inf irrelevant information from X. The same type of things come up in the recent, uh, you know, there's been a flurry of work on self-supervised learning. So here's a, a an image from one of those papers and they define what they call the info min principle. So here you have, so in the picture you'll see you have the frog on the left and then you have two images, you know, two augmentations of that frog. And the idea is those two different views of the frog, you want to uh, maximize the information that each of them has about some target Y and then remove all the other information that those views have with each other. So that's stated down below. Right, maximize information in each view and why and minimize the mutual information between those two views. And so if you look on the right, you can see that, you know, rather than uh, you, know, you want to push the information that uh, between V1 and V2 down, uh, because otherwise you're going to retain lots of irrelevant information. Same type of things uh, come up recently in, in another area called domain generalization, where the aim is to learn, you know, uh, representations that apply to lots of different uh, domains. So here, the domain, you know, different classification problems. You have images and you want to classify them into digits or into various uh, other kinds of categories like uh, offices or 
uh, different aspects of land, uh, and then also different styles of input, different kinds of domains, like you know, handwritten versus uh, drawn versus natural images. Okay, and so here you assume that every example has some side information that says what environment the data comes from, and the goal, in a sense, is to minimize this loss across all environments. And what that really means is you're trying to lose information about the environment, right, and remove that information. So we'll say a little more about that because I'm going to talk more about it. So, so it's called invariant learning is the, the kind of approach to domain generalization. So you want to predict the invariant features from these environments that you've seen during training. You're defining just those features that can predict the class label that regardless of the environment, so you're losing information about the specific environment. So one instance of this that was defined a couple of years ago was the invariant risk minimization. You have some inputs X from environment E and labels Y from that same environment. And you find some transformation so that the probability of the label Y from that environment, uh, given the representation phi of X E, so phi is a transform that it takes the input X into some new representation. So, so conditioned on that representation, the probability of Y should be the same across all environments. Okay, so it's the same across all environments. I'll say something more about that in, uh, in a few minutes. So here's a simple illustration of it though. That's a you know, contrived example where you color n this digits. You take some, you know, some are red, some are green and you divide them into two classes, right? So the low digits, the zero to four are class one class and the high digits five to nine are another class. And then what we have is during training you have a, a a kind of standard colorization so that the red digits or uh, the low digits tend to be red and the high digits tend to be green. All right. So uh, if a, a predictor will tend to focus on the color rather than the actual shape and they, and they enhance this by adding label noise so that the shape isn't always a very good predictor of the, uh, uh, of the actual digit class. Okay. And then we have two different environments where the correlation between the color and the digit changes. So in one of them, it's 0.8 that the low digits are red and the other one, it's 0.9 probability that the low digits are red. And so it's, the key is this difference between those two. So that when you wanna train an invariant predictor, it's gonna learn that this relationship between the environment and the color isn't stable. Whereas the relationship between the shape and color doesn't vary between the environments. And so that's what happens when you train uh, some like standard uh, ERM uh, and you test on the training data, you see you get like 84% correct. But when you test, when you switch the uh, coloring so that the low digits are now green and the high digits are red, you only get, you know, as predictor only gets 10% correct. But when you train with this, something that's ignoring the, uh, you know, noticing that the color varies between the environments and factoring that out kind of removing that information, then you get consistent classification on the training and test. And the reason why it's only 70% is because of this uh, label noise. Okay, so it's a bit of a contrived example, but it gets across this idea that what you wanna do is remove information that's environment specific in order to learn what you really care about these invariant features. And then the last kind of context in which information re removal comes up is in fair, uh, algorithmic fairness. So the last one, at least for the purpose of the talk. Um, so in fair representation learning, this is the uh, setup I want to describe. So the typical idea in, in fairness is that you're doing some classification problem. You have some input data X, you want to predict some label Y, and we'll call Y hat the model prediction. And then you have some sensitive attribute that you've defined. For now, we're going to think of it as a single sensitive attribute. And that could you know, correspond to race or gender, age, something like that. And you want to learn a classifier that's not, not only accurate, but it's fair with respect to A. And there's lots of different definitions of fairness. I'm not going to get into what that second criteria means in this talk. Um, so, but how does the fair representation learning come into it? So the, uh, the formulation is that we're learning this fair classification, which maps X to some representation Z, and then something else that's mapping Z to our prediction Y hat. So we have an encoder F and a classifier G. And the representation, fair representation actually focuses not on Y, but representation Z. And the goal for Z is that it should maintain the useful information in X, but at the same time, yield fair 
but at the same time be fair such that the downstream classifier is fair for all vendors G. That you can use that same representation for any G and it would retain uh, fairness properties. So you want to remove, so one way to do this is to remove information about the sensitive attribute A from the representation Z. So that's my list of uh, applications or areas in which information removal is important. Now, what are some methods? I'm just going to briefly talk about a, a couple methods that people have formed, kinds of methods that people have used for information removal. And one of them is distribution matching. Uh, so here you want to have in mind that you might have two distributions. You have the distributions of the representations that come from, you know, uh, one setting for the information you want to remove and a second distribution for the second setting for the information you wanna remove. You can have more than two settings for that variable. Right now we're gonna think of it as binary, but imagine we just have these two different settings just for ease of understanding. And so each of those has some distributions over representations. And if we can make those two distributions match, then we've removed information about the uh, underlying variable that we wanna uh, remove from the representation, okay? So one way to do that is to match moments of the distribution. So you can look at distance between statistics of those distributions. So the, uh, you know, we have this uh, phi of x that's our, psi of x that's our uh, statistics and we're gonna remove information. And so one way is using MMD that, you know, Arthur Gretton who's gonna talk soon. Um, so, you know, he'd find this maximum mean discrepancy, this kind of uh, way of matching the moments based just on samples from those distributions. Right, so that can be expressed using this kind of kernel trick that says we're going to look at the, you know, you can expand the, the square here and you get these terms that have to do with uh, kind of kernels applied to samples from within one of the uh, distributions or between the two distributions. And so we've done this and applied this in the fairness context. We wanted to remove information about the sensitive variable A where we have an, a regularizer, this MMD regularizer that is uh, using this idea to try to match moments of the distribution. So we've removed information in, about the, in the representation about our uh, underlying sensitive variable. Okay, a second method is adversarial. So uh, in, in that case, we, def we define some computational you know, description of an adversary. So here's another picture from a fairness setup where we have, uh, it's the same kind of notation as before. We have some input X, we have some representation Z that we're learning and some classifier that's trying to predict Y from Z. And we have this adversary that's taking the representation Z and predict, trying to predict A, right? So it's trying to figure out what is the information that Z contains about A. Um, and we're trying to, the aim is to define a representation that removes, that thwarts the adversary, right? Doesn't allow the adversary to predict A. So we, we have a, we had a twist on the, uh, in our work, we had a twist on the adversary, where it's not just trying to remove information given Z, but we have, there's other definitions of fairness that actually rely on the, not that the uh, fairness isn't in general, that the information should be removed from Z, but it's conditioned on Y, all right? So that is, and there's a, something called equalized odds, one of the definitions of fairness that says, you know, that the errors that the, uh, um, that the classifier makes should be balanced between the groups. So that, that errors is, is dependent on the actual class Y as well as the model's prediction. So the adversary for that kind of fairness criteria also has to have access to Y. So there's a missing little arrow that goes from Y in this diagram that so, so the adversary now has access to both Z and Y when it tries to predict A, right? And so we have these two, these loss functions down here that are defined for the adversary, right? And the adversary in one case is sort of something called demographic parity, which is the one that, the standard one where you're trying to just in general remove information that Z has about A. Uh, and then, it, so here we have these different distributions uh, that, where, in this case, uh, um, are drawn where you, for X and A pairs, and the second distribution, it's draw, uh, it depends on, on Y. Okay. 
anyways, the main idea here is that we have this whole suite of adversarial methods that have been applied in fairness and obviously lots of other contexts. So now I wanna focus the talk on a problem which is saying, what happens if we don't know the environment variables or the labels? Um, and so in this case, the idea is that we wanna remove information, but we don't really even know what information we wanna remove, okay? And that comes up in a lot of contexts. We don't, uh, in many cases, we don't know it or that they might even be suboptimal. So this is the case, uh, in, same thing appears in fairness. If you think of the environment labels as equivalent to the sensitive attributes, right? So you're dividing, you can think of the environment labels as partitioning the input into different groups, different, uh, uh, different spaces in a sense, right? And now, so it's the same type of thing in fairness where you're now partitioning the inputs into, into different groups. Um, in fairness, there's been some recent studies called uh, where you, you don't have access to the attributes. You don't really even know which are the important attributes. So it's called subgroup fairness, where you don't know the demographic label. So there's you know two studies that came out on this a few years ago, one called multi-calibration, the other one fairness gerrymandering. And this is a real problem, and especially in fairness, because so an example, um, you know, this is a paper that's um, you know, that when you might not have access to this, uh, this sensitive attribute, it's like but you have unobserved characteristics. An example is, you know, the uh, queer communities. This is an important consideration for that, that community. All right. So this is a, a real problem where you don't necessarily know the environment label or the sensitive attributes. So the aim, an important aim is to say, hey, how can we figure out what the environments are that will help identify those features? And so that in the context we're talking about, how do I identify what information we wanna be removed from a given representation, right? Because we aren't told ahead of time, you know, remove the BMI from the diabetes predictor or, you know, remove information about particular sensitive attributes. So we're gonna focus on a recent paper written with my grad student, Elliot, my postdoc, Yorn, who's now moved on to a position at Apple. So to start with, we're gonna introduce some notation and definitions. Um, so we're gonna have an input space X. We have a set of environments or domains and a target space Y representation space H. Right? So our observational data comes in these triplets where we have X, Y, and E, all right? That's where our data is drawn from. And we have some loss function um, and we have a predictor. So this is in the case Sorry, to, this is in the case where environments are known so far. Okay, and I'm gonna to transition to the case where environments aren't known. We have a predictor that's some linear classifier on top of the representation. Okay, so we learn some representation and have a simple classifier, right? So this is very common in what I talked about earlier, like self-supervised learning. And so we have this, our model that we're concerned with is, is what's learning the representation. So it's mapping x to some space h. So that's the phi of x I introduced before. So standard ERM learning is, you know, just the loss and the, the representation based on the representation phi of x and y, where we draw examples from this, the triplet of x, y, and e. So the related problems like domain generalization says, how can we get low error rates on, on where we draw samples x and y from some, in, based on some test environment where that test environment wasn't observed. And domain adaptation is a version of it. There's a lot of different definitions, but one definition that I like is where we can, it's the same idea, but we can take those model parameters and adapt them at test time using unlabeled examples, right? So these are all related to this kind of, uh, this, this formulation. So the invariant learning problem right, is to learn this representation, phi of x, that's gonna work across environments. Right? And I just wanna, so one thing we should study in this paper is the relationship between invariant learning and fairness. It hasn't really been appreciated much, but I think there's a lot of interesting parallels and synergies between the two. So one example is this one. So in the uh, IRM that what I mentioned before, the invariant risk minimization, the environment and constraints. So this is uh, important 
components. So it's what the environment's constraints is. Imagine we have two environments, E1 and E2. We draw examples from both of those. The idea is that the expected value of Y, given our model that maps X to phi of X, so for particular values of phi, condition on particular values of phi of X in environment one, for those examples, the expected value of Y should match the expected value of Y given that phi of X is the same value for examples drawn from environment two, right? So you're invariant to the environment. The representation learned is invariant to the environment, all right? And this can be generalized to multiple environments, but it's just easiest to think about two now. So this was defined in the, paper, in the IRM paper. Earlier, the definition in the fairness community had something called group sufficiency, which really is almost exactly the same. Uh, we want to match the expected value of Y given S of X and E for all E. And so here E, instead of being environments, are the sensitive groups that I mentioned before. One difference is that S of X is a little bit different than phi of X. S of X is really like the logits of your classifier. It's not necessarily a representation space, but it's the logits of the classifier. Uh, so so yes. uh, may, may I ask a question regarding sure. the use of this constraint for fairness? So uh, I guess, you know, uh, some particular age would be, you know, you know, make you with high probability get a loan, why? But you know, there's the other issue, right? That uh, maybe from, from environment E1, I go to that very golden age with very high probability. And if I'm from environment two, I don't go to that age with uh, high probability, right? So, I mean, could you comment a little bit on what, what type of fairness this enforces? Because, uh, right, uh, um, yeah, it could be the right. Mm -hmm. right. Thanks. So, the idea, yes. So, if you define your representations basically that, you know, Another way to think about that, I think, is that some portion of representation space is devoted to environment one and a separate portion is devoted to environment two. So the environment variance constraint is satisfied somewhat trivially because you never have this overlap, <laughs> or it's very rare to have this overlap in terms of the representations. And yeah, so that's a, uh, an issue in this definition. I mean, in this definition, both from, I think, IRM and from, you know, fairness. It's not unique to fairness, right? So IRM... It, um, won't generalize to new environments very well when this happens, right? So in other words, the, the aim here is to learn things that are invariant across uh, representations that are invariant across uh, environments. But if the representations are devoted to environments, there's no saying what's going to happen when you try to have a new environment, right? So it's the same, the same issue. So, I, so it's, obvious, it's not sufficient, I agree, to define either as a fairness constraint or as a kind of learning constraint. Um, and, you know, so the group sufficiency is, a, is not applying in that it, it's more difficult than the group sufficiency because now you've mapped things down to a logit space, to a one dimensional logit space. Uh, and that as, and so it's possible even there that you can kind of finally, you know, have a granularity such that the S, different portions of the logit space are uh, devoted for different environments and you won't have this, this issue either, right? Uh, so yes, it's a, it is an, a problem and, and this is usually, most of these are regularizers though. So that the question is whether you're able to do this and still do a very good job on your, um, on your classification task, right? So you, so uh, it, it's, you know, if you have a rich enough model class such that you can do this and have, you know, the represent enough representation space so that each environment gets its own representation and do a good job on classification, then it's, uh, you know, it's a kind of an overfitting problem in some sense. You have too rich a model class for the problem. Okay, so one is, so, um, so here's a one way that we've defined for uh, environment, for learning an environment, okay, where you don't, aren't given it. Okay, so that's the goal now. We aren't given the environment. And we're trying to capitalize on the idea that learning systems tend to find shortcuts. So this is a kind of canonical example of that. You train up a learning system on cows on grass to identify cows and the learning system will focus on the environment, right? That it's the, the grass or the background. And so cows running through uh, the surf won't be uh, detected as cows. So, and so the system finds shortcuts, easy ways of detecting cows that are invariant to different kinds of cows. Uh, variant to the background. If you have environments defined based on shortcut, then 
invariant learning is going to be focused on features that we don't want it to, like the background. Okay, so think about that. That came up also in our synthetic example about color MNIST, where the the shortcut classifier relied on color. So, if we had an environment though that where E1, the first environment, were all red digits and E2 were all green digits, and then we trained up an uh, a classifier to be invariant to the environment, then it would be invariant to color. All right, so the color features are then not invariant across these, uh, these domains. Uh, so this is the motivating idea, the kind of simple idea that says, okay, maybe what we could do is assume that our system is gonna find shortcuts and use the, and capitalize on that to define worst case environments. So if we're trying to satisfy this environment invariance constraint, uh, we define a per environment risk. So we're drawing examples from X, Y, a given you know, some environment, we're trying to minimize the loss on that. So the actual IRM, what it regular, it, it's you know, minimizing the environment invariance constraint is not simple, right? Because you're, you're then conditioning on phi of X equals H. And so how are you gonna actually evaluate that for uh, you know, high dimensional representation space uh, and look for the case where they match. And so instead what they optimize is a differential proxy, differentiable proxy to that, which relies on the uh, gradients uh, being minimized across environments, right? Um, and so that's the actual thing that they uh, minimize as a, a regularizer on top of, um, you know, classification performance. So what our, our approach is to define our worst case environment by maximizing this EAIC. So we're going to have some classifier, some reference classifier, we'll call it, that comes up with an initial phi that we're assuming relies on shortcuts, right? It's going to use things that spurious features that it shouldn't, like background features or color or things like that that aren't the invariants. And so then we're going to use that idea to then say, okay, well, now we're going to try to maximize this uh, environment invariance constraint. Given that, so we're going to try to, the adversary is in a sense, the, the environment definition is kind of adversarial. It's going to be the worst case environment for us. And then we're going to minimize, uh, turn around and minimize, given those, that environment definition, minimize this uh, EIC or any kind of invariant learning constraint. So here's a summary. So instead of having handcrafted environments, we're going to start with some reference model. Like I said, we're going to train up an initial classifier that we're going to assume it's going to learn some sort of spurious features. And it defines these putative invariant features, but those typically won't be what we want. Like it might be the color in the MNIST ideas, in the MNIST, uh, color MNIST uh, experiment. And then we're going to do environment assignment per example using a Bernoulli probability Q. All right, so here's the algorithm sketch. We find some reference model by tilde. Uh, we fix that one, and then we optimize the inner loop to infer the environment. So we infer these assignments of, for each example, I to an environment by uh, you know, using Q that's going to be maximizing the, uh, this proxy, this uh, EIC proxy. Then we fix that Q, which is fixing in the environment assignments, and now we're going to optimize the outer loop, which is the original uh, invariant learning, which is going to optimize both uh, for classification plus this regularizer. Okay. So, and how does this do in color MNIST? It actually outperforms uh, ERM, which isn't a big surprise. Uh, the ERM, like we said, when you train ERM and then test it where you've switched the color definitions so that the red, what was the low digits are now green instead of red, it does badly. IRM, which uses the handcrafted environments. So IRM, you know that environment, one environment, the, the between environments, the, the correlations between color and digit switches. So IRM actually you know, does much better than ERM. But in our case, where we learn our, our environments rather than handcrafting them, we do uh, considerably better on test, test performance than IRM. We also tested on some other synthetic data sets. So Waterbirds is another example where we have you know, birds that tend to appear on water, uh, on water backgrounds and, and birds that tend to appear on land, on land backgrounds. And the uh, aim is 
bird that's a, a water bird or a bird. So the background again is a is a very kind of good cue, but there's going to be some examples where it's switched, right? And then what we want to do is measure the worst group performance. That is, in the worst group performance are the land birds that at test time appear on water and the water birds that appear on land backgrounds. And so ERM does very badly on this worst group performance because they're very infrequent in the data set. There's another method called uh, group distributionally robust optimization that can do well on this, but it's told what the groups are. It's told that you know water birds are on water and land birds are on land. In our case, we're going to infer the environments and then optimize based on those inferred environments. So we're going to use their same Oracle thing, but without the handcrafted environments or kind of domain knowledge about the environments. Instead, we're going to do our first step of defining the environments, inferring what the environments are, and then optimizing. And we do quite well on uh, test on this worst group that is the water birds on land or land birds on water. Okay. Um, and maybe to leave time for questions, I'll, I'll skip some of this, but the idea here was, well, just to briefly summarize is that, you know, this isn't a foolproof method by any means. It really depends on the reference model. The assumption is that the reference model has learned a spurious feature. And when the reference model hasn't learned spurious features, if the reference model is good and ignores color, for example, in the color MNIST and actually figures out on shape, then our method is not going to improve on things. So it's really the question of whether these kind of initial model, the reference model is focusing on, uh, not on the features that we really care about, that we, that's what our method relies on. I see there's something in the chat. Let me take a look and see if I can answer that. How do you prevent learning the truly important feature? So that's what I was just saying, I think. So the answer to that is you aren't preventing it. You're assuming that there's going to be some, not some the initial reference model is going to learn it, right? So we have no control over what that is going to learn. So one way you can do that is assuming that the spurious features are simple. So there's been other, other people have uh, attempted something similar. This was some other work that came out around the same time or just after ours. There's a method called just train twice uh, or another one called the too good to be true prior. And all our method and these other methods all rely on this idea in some sense, the too good to be true idea, which is like saying, we're going to have some prior that says the initial model is too good. It you know appears to be good, but it's not really that good. It's the whole idea of shortcuts. So we're relying on the idea that the initial model is going to find shortcuts. If the initial model is really good and it doesn't find shortcuts, then these methods aren't going to improve, right? So it's still a good open question of how are we going to find environments, infer environments when we aren't don't know them at all. And so this is one idea about how to do that, which is to assume that the environments are defined in a sense by uh, you know, an initial models uh, locking onto spurious features. So wait, there's another question in the chat. Let me see if I can pull that one up. Okay, same person. Wait. Lost my mouse to get rid of that. Okay. Um, okay, so good. So just wanted to leave some time for some discussion and questions. So let me just summarize about EEL, what we call this method is EEL for environment inference for invariant learning. So our aim is discover, to discover environments. And it's like I said, it has this parallels on work that's gone on, very interesting work that I, if you're aware of it, I encourage you to look at that. There's all kinds of work going on in the fairness community on this basic idea about multi-calibration, which is, uh, which is, um, the idea that you want to have fairness defined not just for a single group, but for multiple groups. And in many cases, the idea is that those groups can be not necessarily predefined. Those groups can be defined based on some, uh, some simple computational circuit that's going to look at the input and define what's in a group. And you're going to do this repeatedly. So like the multi-calibration approach is a, really a boosting approach, where at every round, you're going to find a new a uh, simple computational circuit that looks at the input and defines group membership that's the worst case group according to your current message method, and then refine your classifier to do well on the worst case group. And that's the, uh, the second round of the boosting. So again, you iterate through this um, in a standard boosting style, but that's also relying on the idea that you have this worst case, this, uh, so it's uh, similar to ours, right? So you want to define it in a, in a worst case method. Uh, approach to define what the environments, or in, our, in that case, what the uh, worst case groups are with respect to fairness. 
That's what I, what's challenging about it is that it's really dependent on our model. So the question is, can we infer what the target environments are? And more generally, what kind of distribution shift, but what kind of new environments do we really want to target? So I think this is a really important open question that's you know more general now about this is really about domain generalization and questions about how much how much can we really expect the system to generalize to new environments, right? So I think that the uh, this field is really in its infancy for this, and I think it's a real interesting open questions about what do, what is reasonable to expect and ask about our systems in terms of what they should generalize to. And then maybe more pertinent to the topic of the direct topic of the workshop is that the current methods we have for removing information from representations really aren't uh, satisfactory or they aren't quite what we want. So I mentioned distribution matching and that doesn't scale up very well to very kind of high dimensional continuous representation space that are being learned in, in these kinds of models. Um, and adversarial methods are attractive, but as everybody knows, right, there's like all kinds of computational challenges in trying to do this and the whole minimax problem that uh, is, is really a difficult optimization. Um, and, you know, and then there's this other idea that came up from talked about in IRM, there's this differentiable proxy, but it's really not understood. And I think an interesting question to say, how do those relate to the desired invariance properties, right? So that's another kind of open question I think is uh, interesting and relevant. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for a, for the for a very interesting talk, uh, Rich. Um, I'm sure there are questions. I have several, but uh, is there any question from the uh, auditorium first? Okay, so let me start with one question that I have. So, um, um, so I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the objective function, uh, but but could, could you comment a little bit on like, is there a, let's say baby uh, theoretical setting, like, uh, uh, like, you know, like learning mixtures of regressions or like so, some like baby stylistic, stylistic model where I can interpret uh, your, objective function as, as trying to, you know, estimate that model uh, is like, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, right. Let's see. So the objective is, uh, let me think about that. Um, right. So we have, um, yeah, so we, we, the model assumes that there are both spurious features and kind of, you know, signal features and noise features, right? And, you know, and that's questionable assumption, but for the sake of our, our baby example, we'll do that. Um, and the, so the model is going to um, have some representation that's gonna be potentially containing both sets of features, right? And so the, Trying to map this to like a, not really a mixture model so much, but you can think of it. Yeah, there are if the features can be clearly identified as either uh, spurious or noise features. All right, then um, right, then you can say the environment invariance objective that you were asking about before, right, is saying that the um, what defines the noise features is or the what defines the uh signal features is that they are invariant across environments so we have to have some environment uh, the data is drawn from you know you have, some data is drawn from environment one some data is drawn from environment two in both cases we'll have noise features and signal features and so the aim is to in a sense remove the noise features and just focus on the signal features all right so uh you know, so you have a, a lot, you know, think of it as a vector of features and, and, and we want to just eliminate the set that are noise features and, and preserve the ones that are, are signal features. Um, so I think, you know, we could define that as a, a mixture model where we're going to, you know, or some sort of generative model. We're going to first choose the environment. Given the environment, we're going to choose the, the set of features, both from the noise pool and the, and the invariant pool, and then generate the input given that. So that's how I would think of it as a, you know, a generative model. And now we want to invert that model 
for the noise feedback for the signal features. Uh, but but there is, I, I guess, I guess the point of my a bit confusion is, I guess in the example of, uh, you know, like water birds on land and yeah. I don't know, like and birds on water, yeah, <laughs> and cows yeah. on the beach or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I guess you know, like uh, uh, pre, pre, you know, like pre, pre, there must be some overlap property between. I mean, uh, between you know. Um, because otherwise I could very well latch on the on the wrong features and they're informative for the examples that I've seen, right? So there is yeah. so there is this in the synthetic examples, both for color and this and for I mean the water birds is an as, a, as an example, just to stick to that one, right? There is it's it's too synthetic in a way. So right, so if you focus on the background, right? Um, then you'll do very well on uh, on almost all the examples, um, and not do that well on the uh, you know the the rare ones, which have the water birds on land and vice and land birds on water. Um, and so ERM, they're just taking advantage of the fact that ERM is going to you know focus on the majority of the examples, uh, which is you know uh, where the it's consi they're consistent. So the um, more generally, I think there is this issue, which is that there's a strong correlation between often you don't, you can't completely ignore some set of features. So it could be, I think what you're getting at is that, you know, it, it could be that some, the features aren't clearly either noise or signal there's, or, or there's going to be some mixture. Right. And so the real thing is that I think the real problem is that you, and there's going to be interesting correlations between these things. So the real thing, what you really want to be able to do is identify sets of features that are more invariant than others and capitalize on those when you go to domain generalization. So you're going to allow a system to learn some features that may be very use, very kind of domain specific or specific to a small set of domains and other ones that are fairly invariant. And as long as you have identified those, then you should expect a good generalization because you're going to allow the system to learn, you know, and, and use the features that are more invariant so that when you generalize to the environment. So I think the, I'm not sure if this is exactly answering your question, but in my view of it, there's, it's not this strict definition of, you know, either noise or, or signal features, right? That you can, you know, find things that are relevant to, to the signal in both, you know, many features are relevant to the signal in both, but some of the idea is that there are going to be some features that are more relevant uh, across many environments. And those are the invariant ones that you want to focus on. All right. So like the BMI example is one where they're, in that case, they know what the spurious, that one spurious feature is. You don't want to focus on BMI, but you could train up another classifier that ignores BMI. There could be some other features that you find that are still pretty indicative and informative and you want to keep those, but you want to know that those are kind of domain specific so that when you then train on some new, you know, some new, uh, I don't know, groups that you, you can uh, allow the ones that are, are more invariant to dominate. Yeah, thank you. I, I guess I have to think about uh, uh, a situation where, you know, I can say, you know, like uh, under the such and such condition, uh, the right thing is identifiable. And uh, yeah, uh, but right. I think it, it would go kind of like how do you describe like a uh, generative model where uh, there is a predictive feature and a noise feature. And yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like there's something in the chat here. What is yeah. it? Are there human in the loop solutions to this. Well, I think the diabetes example is a human in the loop, right? So the human, the domain experts know in that case that BMI, it turns out, isn't a very good predictor. Whether those humans knew, before, I'm sure they knew before there were any classifiers trained, but maybe, you know, you have to go study the new culture and find that the correlations are different in the new culture. So I think that uh, there's certainly a lot of room for humans to try to identify what features tend to be noise and what features tend not to be noise. Um, and uh, like for the, and for the environment idea, or, or you know, for the fairness idea, we have some definition of what we think are definitions of demographic groups and what we want to be fair to include those demographic groups. But we also think there's other things that may not be as obvious, right? So I think it's an interesting situation where there's things that we know we have to be fair to about, you know, race and gender and things like that. But there are 
online you know, trips groups or something that or things that aren't very observable in the data that you know we, we don't know ahead of time. And so I think there's some mix between human knowledge and what's known ahead of time versus the actual the system defining groups. And then maybe a human then has to come in and say, is this a group that we're worried about? Is this a group that we want to be invariant to? You know, uh, and so I think there is, and, and so ideally there's some interpretability there too, where you can identify what groups are enough that somebody can look at it and say, yeah, that's something that's you know something that be can that, that we should be concerned about and make sure that the systems, you know fair to that group. Um, how can this line of methods connect to the reweighting method, which is also common? Yes, so, so reweighting, I think is, is the idea that like an ERM, so like with the Waterbirds example is something where you can try to combat it by saying, well, it's very rarely do you see water birds on land in the data set and, and rarely do you see land birds on water. You always see, you know, water birds on water and land birds on land. And so why don't we, if we know ahead of time, we can reweight. Right, we can say, you know, put much more weight on the loss of uh, those uh, those rarer examples. Um, so I have a couple comments on that. One is that reweighting is okay in some sense. It doesn't. There's been some interesting work on showing that that doesn't always solve the problem. Right, so it's a reweighting isn't isn't the going to be the the answer. I mean, one one thing is that you know there's just just by reweighting it doesn't mean that you're going to actually learn a classifier that generalizes well to new examples from that infrequent distribution. Um, and, uh, and then the second point is that uh, more to what, what I was focused on in the eel is that reweighting assumes that you know what the distributions are ahead of time. You've identified them so that you can reweight them, right? So here the idea was, can we infer which are the distributions that are less, uh, you know, that have to be reweighted, but we don't know it ahead of time. So that's this dual problem of finding the, which, which are the kind of, you know, infrequent examples, what's the, uh, that hasn't been sampled enough. And then one way to solve it is by doing reweighting or some of these other invariant learning methods that have other approaches to reweighting. So I can think of these, you know, the invariant uh, principles like the EIC one I talked about is, is an alternative in a sense to reweighting. It's an alternative that says, well, rather than reweighting the data, we're going to have this constraint that we want to fit to the data. So we have a paper you could take of where we actually tried to explore and compare reweighting to some of these other examples in uh, in these contexts, and found that, to be honest, none of them are so far. I would say are that satis that satisfactory. Uh, so that's a paper we had at uh, at the last NERPS that we called Nooch. So if you look that up, you'll at least see some empirical studies of it. That just doesn't doesn't suggest something better. It shows that what we have currently isn't isn't great. <laughs> Can these be combined, such as learn the weights at the same time? So I think that's really what we're trying to do here: is learn the weights adversarially, right? So it's if you think of that's what we're doing is we're saying trying to define. So we so. Like the water birds on land, the land birds on water. Think of that as we don't have we have some group that is uh, uh, you know undersampled in the data set or underrepresented in our data set. So you know you can think of this in a fairness context or you know in the birds on water kind of context. We aren't being fair to those land birds that live on on water. Um, so we want to. So we don't know ahead of time that. The important thing is if we don't know ahead of time that the background uh, with the label, the correlation between that is what defines the groups that are, you know, undersampled, right? So that's what we're trying to do is adversarially say, look, this is a, this is an inv this is a group that is uh, kind of worst case group in a sense, group that's going to be not treated very well. And then when once we define that worst case group, then we're going to try to optimize. And so ours is one way of doing it. There's others that have other ways of doing this. So you could take, there's, you know, work on uh, another kind of method is conditional uh, variance at risk, which tries to focus on the loss of the examples that have the, the worst case loss, right? So that's like saying, you know, you take some parameter alpha and say, we're gonna make sure, we don't care about the rest of the examples. We're going to train a, train a classifier, find which are the worst case ones, and then ensure that the worst case ones have at least a, a, a reasonable loss, right? It shouldn't be too low. So that's another form of this. And there's other things like 
uh, distribution robust optimization you'd be phrasing. So those are all of this flavor, like you're trying to define the groups that are the worst off in some sense and optimize on those. One difference between those methods and ours and that this is ours is more of a distinct iteration. So those are kind of one unified objective where you you kind of focus on the worst case loss and ensure that that's optimized throughout. Ours is more uh, the boosting style thing where you're going to go back and forth. And there's pluses and minuses to those two that, you know, that we could discuss. But, uh, but those are, but the, the, in a sense, all of these are, are aiming at the same thing, which is in some sense trying to define which are the kinds of examples that are not being treated well. And can we then make a, a classifier that does well, you know, uh, at least reasonably well on, on all of those. And, let, and so it, you can think of that as, if we can think of it as the worst case ones, have some in, information that define them. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to define what is the information that defines those, right? So it's like the color and color mnist, or, you know, it could be some uh, demographic information in the case of fairness. And then ensure that the system is uh, good for those, then you're satisfying the, the kind of worst worst case. So that's so going back to my theme was about removing information. You want to have the information about those groups not be be obvious in the representation because if it's obvious in the representation, then the system can you know potentially you know make use of that information and do badly on one group or another. But I do think that it's, you know, there's this underlying question of, you know, in fairness, it's so often in these cases, the real focus is on trans on generalization to something new. It's about transfer learning in some sense, right? So that's why the domain generalization is inherently that way. That's the way we formulated the kind of fairness in the representation learning for fairness is that you're learning representations that ideally transfer in a new context maybe to a new data set or to a, in a new context. And so all of these really focus on the transfer context. It's not about, you know, IID data, it's some new, new data set. And so that's, that's the real motivation in some sense for removing the information because you think that some information that seems to be relevant in your training data may not be relevant when it comes to your, your, your test scenarios, right? So I think that's the real focus in all of these cases. It's really about transfer to some new, new domain. And that goes back to my point here about what kinds of shifts are reasonable for us to work on, right? So for the diabetes predictor, you know, certainly it's reasonable to try to use that for, I don't know, different populations. And I think in a lot of our classification examples in the machine learning that may not have like a real health application, but other cases, you know, what kind of, how, what kind of, shifts do we want to really uh, build our system to be robust to? And I think that our current method of doing, you know, one data set and then testing on another data set is, uh, isn't very um, principled in a way, right? We want to think about what, what space are we talking about that we really want to shift uh, and be able to learn a classifier in one set space and shift it to another. All right. Uh, thank you very much again, Maritz, for the great talk. Okay. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Enjoyed it. All right. Good. And I'll uh, see you later this afternoon on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks.